glad that we are continuing in our series looking at the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' kind of best teaching all in one place. And we're looking at it as it appears in Matthew 5 to 7. If you've not had a chance to read that before now, can I recommend that this afternoon you take some time just to read those three chapters. This beautiful sermon that Jesus preaches that captures what it is, this thing, the kingdom of God that Jesus is bringing. We're going to hear just a, a small chunk of it this morning. We're, we're taking it one little bite-sized piece at a time. And we are in, put it on the screen for you, Matthew chapter 5. And we're verse 17 to 20. In mine it's titled, The Fulfillment of the Law. If you remember to find that. You'll also notice this morning we put the, uh, the church Bibles back into the chair. So if you haven't got uh, your own Bible with you, we would encourage you to bring your own Bible. But if you haven't got one, there's uh, one nearby, you can grab that and encourage you to keep it open. We're going to go through this line by line in just a moment. But as we hear these words, if you're comfortably able to stand, would you stand with me? Hear the good news hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus is speaking. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfil them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Father, would you come now by your Spirit and open our hearts and minds to receive your word for us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do you keep that open as you take a seat. And what you have, if you're holding a Bible or a phone with a Bible app, what you're holding is a collection of writings, a, a collection of books even, a library if you like. Most of it is, is story, there's some poetry in there, there's some biographies and some letters, and there's even a play, and, and there's some writing that we don't even have a category for anymore, called apocalyptic, all about the end of things. And it's, a, it's written by dozens of human authors over a period of about a thousand years or so. All of it is written in another time, in another place, in another language to act, and a very different culture. And yet, even today, it remains the best-selling book year in, year out, to the point where they don't even bother putting it on the list because it is always sitting there, right at the top. There's something about this collection of writings that people keep coming back to. And if you, if you do dive into it, you'll, you'll begin to realise quite quickly why. If you want to find out about love or hate, about war and futility and violence, about justice and injustice, about what happens to a society where there is a growing gap between the rich and the poor, about what happens when church gets in bed with the empire. If you want to know about trauma and healing, about the meaning and purpose of life, about mortality, about how to discipline your kids, about sex in pretty much every variety, about the end of the world, about doubt and faith, if you want to find out about these things, you can find them in the Bible. But there are some problems with the Bible. The first problem is that people don't read it. Uh, but then after that, there are those who perhaps do read it and don't understand it. And if that's you, then we can give you some tools that might help with that. But perhaps the biggest category are those who read it and maybe mostly understand it. Sure, there are some technical complexities and things to, to wrestle with. But those who do read it and mostly understand it, but then take issue with it and seek to argue back against it. You may be aware, for example, that the church in the West is facing something of a crisis. There are a number of well-publicised debates going on around all sorts of questions, probably the most obvious of which 
being those around the discussions around sexuality, gender, marriage. That's not one conversation, that is a whole set of conversations around there. But the issue behind all of those other issues is the Bible. I'm convinced that this is the main challenge for the church moving forward. And the real question for us is, does the Bible have authority? And if so, what kind of authority does it have? So this little section, these verses we heard a moment ago, might just be one of Jesus' most important teachings for us in our context in the West right now. Because it is essentially Jesus' take on the Bible. What does Jesus think about the scriptures? And therefore, how do we engage with the scriptures the way Jesus engages with the Bible? So, with that in mind, let's look at, verse, at each verse in turn. So verse 17, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now keep in mind that uh, the Bibles we have in front of us today are not, they didn't exist in this form at the time of Jesus. Jesus was busy kind of doing most of what we're reading in the New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament on kind of separate kind of scrolls or codices. And they call that the scriptures, or the law and the prophets. It's what we call the Old Testament. And, and what Jesus is saying here is, I've not come to abolish those. In relation to the Bible, that term abolish is a technical term, meaning to disobey or disrespect the scriptures and what they're saying. And we don't really know the background to this, we don't know the details, but, but it seems that Jesus' teaching so far has already been so radical that some people thought he was trying to get rid of the scriptures. And so he's saying really clearly, no, I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfil them. And that's a surprising word for Jesus to use there, because the opposite of abolishing, the opposite of disobeying or disrespecting something, is to obey it, or to respect it, to uphold it in, in, in every aspect. But instead, Jesus uses a different word. He says, I've come to fulfil the scriptures. And it's a word used throughout Matthew's Gospel to show that Jesus is the one who fulfils every promise of scripture. Jesus is pointing to the fact that he is doing something quite new here. We have two very different approaches in, in politics and in theology and in the church. Uh, two kind of broad approaches in almost every sphere you get them. And Jesus is addressing the ancient versions of these. Jesus is avoiding the ancient version of kind of liberalism and progressivism, where you kind of disregard and disobey and sideline everything that has gone before to make a completely new path. So Jesus is, is avoiding that path that says, let's just ditch the Bible and start again. But he's also avoiding the other side of things, the more conservative side of things. He, he's not running along with the conservative Jewish reading of the scriptures as closed and static and not really going anywhere just to be kept because, well, that's what you do. Now Jesus is forging a new path down the middle that says all of the scriptures now need to be looked at in light of Jesus. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfil them, he says. Read them in light of me and what I am doing. Verse 18. For uh, I tell you the truth, Lord, truly I tell you. Uh, it's a little catchphrase that Jesus has, and he uses it at least 30 times in Matthew's Gospel. So we're going to hear it a lot. But really, it's just a little kind of catchphrase that means, listen up. I'm about to say something really important. And the something I'm about to say is going to come as a bit of a surprise to you. You might not like it immediately. So listen up, pay attention. Until heaven and earth disappear, that's a very, very long time, uh, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law. Another commentator puts it like this, not one dot of an I or one cross of a T will drop out of the law. In other words, the Bible, right down to the smallest of details, will last until everything is accomplished. It's a fair question to ask, well, until what is accomplished? 
Well, Jesus had just said he's come to fulfill the scriptures. The whole of the Old Testament was signposting and pointing forward to something, to someone who is Jesus. And so the scriptures will stand until Jesus has accomplished his work, until Jesus returns and completes the work that he has started. Verse 19, uh, in my version of the NIV, it doesn't have the word therefore, but it is in the Greek, therefore, uh, signaling that this is the point that Jesus really wants to make. Therefore, anyone who breaks, that word is to break or sets aside, relaxes, loosens up a bit, the least one of these laws and commands. What commands is Jesus referring to? Is it the the Old Testament ones, or is it the ones that Jesus is about to give? Well, I think the answer to that has to be both. Because Jesus is about to give his teaching on the Old Testament. What we're listening to in the Sermon on the Mount is a Bible teacher teaching on the Bible. So it's both. And what he's saying is, if your approach is to explain away the bits that you don't like, you will be called the least in the kingdom of God. Uh, John Mark Comer, I need to credit him with listening to all of his teaching from Bridgetown uh, as a, a background and backdrop to uh, preparing for this uh, series. And he puts this verse uh, like this. It says, if you take even one odd, obscure command from the Bible, and more specifically, mine as Jesus' teachings in and on the Bible, and you explain it away or ignore it, or do some hermeneutical gymnastics to make it say what you want it to say, you'll relegate yourself to the margins in the kingdom of God. So aside from anything else, let's just notice this. There is a link between how you treat your Bible and, and your experience of God. God's treatment of you will mirror your treatment of the Scripture. worth pausing on that question how seriously are you taking God? If, if the measure was how seriously you're taking the scriptures, how seriously have you taken God this week? And then we get the flip side. Whoever does take it seriously and practices these commands, in other words, they don't just shrug it off or cherry pick or read selectively or whatever, they will be called great in the kingdom of God. So, easy sermon so far. Read your Bible, do what it says. Fair enough. But Jesus isn't done yet. There is one more verse. Verse 20. For I tell you, it's that phrase again, listen up, pay attention, unless your righteousness, and that's the word about being right before God, it's like our goodness in the eyes of God, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Harsh words. These are the people whose job it was full time to study and understand the scriptures and then pass on that understanding to other people. And Jesus seems to be saying, we've got to do it better than them. But I don't think Jesus is saying, we've got to be more rigorous in the way we behave in relation to the commandments. I don't think the righteousness Jesus is talking about is, is talking about the level of behaviour. We're going to see this as the, as the series goes on. Jesus isn't talking about righteousness at the level of behaviour, he's talking about righteousness at the level of the heart. In the next part of the Sermon on the Mount, over these coming weeks, we'll see this. Jesus gives six examples of what this looks like. And they all use the same sort of formula. Jesus will say, you have heard it said, and then he'll quote to us a, a teaching from the Old Testament. And then Jesus will say, but I say to you, and then he'll give his own interpretation, his own teaching based on that command. Now each of those examples is teaching us something. It's teaching us first of all, how does Jesus read the Bible? When Jesus reads those things in the scriptures, how does he handle that? But, but then secondly, it gives us examples of the kind of righteousness Jesus is talking about here. So just one example, I won't go into details, I don't want to spoil uh, next week. Uh, but the first one is the command not to murder. 
And chances are, most if not all of us in this room can hold up our hand and say, tick, I've done that, I've kept that command. But Jesus, as we'll see, takes it to the level of the heart and says, no, 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 if you've even thought angrily about someone, if you have held contempt in your heart for someone, you have as good as murdered them. Jesus is talking about righteousness at the level of the heart. Jesus is saying basically, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you can't just read the Bible and obey its, all of its commands. What you really need is that the ideas that the Bible is getting at to infiltrate your heart and your mind and then to transform you from the inside out so that you become a whole new kind of person, a whole new kind of human being, living life in the kingdom of God. So the Bible isn't just meant to be read and believed. It's not just read it and mentally agree with it. It's meant to be lived. Whoever practices these commands will be called great in the kingdom of God. And so what we need to do is to wrestle with it, to get to the heart behind what God is saying in it. So we can summarise this, this passage in this way. There's, there's two things going on here. There's, there's a warning from Jesus. A warning of what will happen if we choose to set aside even the least command. If, if our approach is to pick and choose, to pay selective attention, to reconstruct the Bible to suit our own preferences, Jesus warns us what will happen, that we will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because we can't really say Jesus is Lord and then reject the Lord's way of engaging with the scriptures. We can't say Jesus is Lord and sing the songs that we've just been singing and then ignore the commands that we are given in scripture, no matter how difficult they may be. And with that in mind, I find this next quote really helpful from Andrew Wilson. He says this, our trust in the Bible stems from our trust in Jesus Christ. He says, I don't trust in Jesus because I trust the Bible. I trust the Bible because I trust in Jesus. I love him and I've decided to follow him. So, if he, if Jesus, talks and acts as if the Bible is trustworthy, authoritative, good, helpful and powerful, I will too. Even if some of my questions remain unanswered, or my answers remain unanswered. Brings us back to this question of have we decided who is God? Do we do we want to go about life as if we are God? Or have we truly acknowledged that the Lord is God and therefore we listen to him? So there's a warning in these words from Jesus, but there is also an invitation. An invitation to practice the way of Jesus found in the scriptures. And then over time, as we do that, over a life live following Jesus to become a shining example of life lived in the kingdom of God. So a warning, an invitation, a Bible hopefully in your hand. What will you do with it? What will you do with it this week? Shall we pray? <coughs> Father, we don't want to be those who hear your word and then Go away forgetting all about it, like someone looking in the mirror and then walking off forgetting what they look like. We want to be those who hear your word, who take it to heart, who seek to live it out in the strength and power of your spirit, and in so doing to become more and more like Jesus. God, this is not a game that we are playing here. You have invited us to live life in your kingdom. You went to the cross to make that life possible. And so God, we're sorry for the times where we've just taken it so lightly, we've ignored it, we've, we've not even paid attention to it. Or worse, we're trying to twist it and make it say what we want it to say. Jesus, you are Lord. You are the king of the kingdom of God.
not me, not us. So would you help us this week to hear your voice in the scriptures? To be transformed as we read and wrestle with your command. we might be those who are called great in the kingdom of heaven. As we learn to live and become more like Jesus. Do it, Lord, for your glory. 